All right, let's do this too. I'm gonna fix this real quick here. And okay, well, sorry about the technical difficulties there. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are kind of guests on each other's YouTube channels. Uh, yeah. Joe, Mr. Joe Bachata, am I pronouncing that right? Bahoda, the C silent. Bahoda. Oh, Bahoda. I'm sorry. All right. Not a problem. I Everybody, butcher everyone's last name. <laughs> well, thanks for sitting down and having this conversation with me, brother. Uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, yeah, of course. And so what we're going to do, we are going to have a conversation about various vain worldly ideologies, various worldly philosophies that are setting themselves up against Christianity. I think there are several uh, that oh, yeah. are doing that. We're going to talk about all of them, every single one of them. We're going to talk about a lot of them. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, did you want to, do you want to kind of introduce yourself just a little bit more um, sure. and say a few things about yourself real quick before we get started, brother? Yeah. Well, I'm Joe Bahoda, and um, I have my own YouTube channel called Walking Through the Scriptures with Joseph Bahoda. It used to be uh, Big Country 35 Able. I, I changed the, the name for obvious reasons because people are like, what is up with that? Um, so walking through the scriptures with Joseph Bahoda is my channel. And um, I've been saved now for about a little over 25 years. And I got saved in military. I'm a 20-year army guy. I did four combat tours. And so, but in that 20 years, I, I've been in the church for a lot. And I was in the word of faith, prosperity gospel movement for a little bit. My son went to Bethel. So he was part of the NAR, New Apostolic Reformation for a little bit. Um, I, I actually got ordained as an elder in a prosperity gospel word of faith church. So I know what they teach, what they believe. Unfortunately, I used to teach a lot of that myself. Um, I actually pastored the gospel service in Iraq on my first tour. So unfortunately, I taught a lot of that stuff when I was pastoring in Iraq, because that's what I was influenced and accustomed to believe. That was the movement. Now, they told me they were word of faith when I first joined them, but I didn't know what word of faith meant. I didn't know anything about it. I was like, well, it's the Bible, so it must be true. Um, I didn't really know anything about denominationalism. This was back in, I don't know, 2003-ish. So this was like 19 years ago. So I didn't know, you know, like I said, I've been saved only like 20, well, I can't say like 25 years, but 25 years. So I was only saved maybe five or six years when all this went down. I didn't know what word of faith, prosperity gospel meant. These were all concepts that meant nothing to me at the time. I was just happy that somebody accepted me and I was, thank God I was an elder, you know, and pastoring and I was just happy. So it wasn't until later on when I went to Wayland Baptist University, I was part of their branch campus in Hawaii when I got stationed in Hawaii and I started to take like biblical interpretation classes and hermeneutic classes and preaching classes. And I was like, what in the world was I being taught? And that was around 2008, 2009, somewhere around there. And I started to really get into these, these classes. And I was like, wow, they are just butchering scripture to make it be whatever their narrative is. And so they're basically doing whatever they want to do to butcher the scripture. And that's what I was finding out. So ever since around 2011, I officially came out of the movement and I've been, I repented of all that stuff that I taught and I've been teaching new stuff now. <laughs> so I've been on this journey now for about 11 years. Praise the Lord. I think a lot of people probably saw you on April Chapman's YouTube channel. She is a dear sister in the Lord. She has an excellent, yeah. I believe she's called, uh, she switched her YouTube name up. It's now called the Truth Podcast. Standard, or something. standard of Truth. Standard of Truth. Standard of yeah. the Standard of Truth. Yes. So if you haven't checked out the Standard of Truth, I'll, I'll try to remember to put a link to her channel in the description of this video below. So brother Joe, Bahoda. And, and you know what the funny thing is, uh, I'm pretty sure you said that when she was talking to you as well. And it just completely slipped my mind. So oh, I funny. think one of the things I think that stood out about you that I just absolutely love and, and respected uh, right off the bat, because you and I talked a, a little bit offline, uh, is the your military service. And not only that, but the fact that you've been deployed uh, and the fact that you are a chaplain. So uh, nothing but love and respect for you. And you're not just approaching this from the 
outside looking in. You were part of the movement. You were in, yeah. on the inside, one of the people that was there looking at it, um, involved in it. Uh, and I, th- I want to say a few things at the outset that, you know, I think there is a lot of truth mixed in with um, some of these false teachings, some of these yeah. worldly vanity philosophies that are coming in. In fact, let me let me do this real quick. Let me share screen. Let's let's go to the Word of God, the Bible, real quick here. Sure. And uh, there are three verses that I really think apply to what we're going to be talking about here. First verse comes out of. Can you see that? Is that too small? Or no, I, I can see it. Mm-hmm. Cool. So my eyesight is horrible. So I, <laughs> I try to blow everything up. So Second Corinthians chapter ten verse five says, "We demolish arguments and every." pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive. uh, I'm sorry, we take every captive, wait, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I'm so used to memorizing scripture and different translations. Um, Mm. Usually I do the ESV. This is the NIV. That's what busted me up a little bit. But yeah, we take every thought captive uh, and make it obey Christ. We make it obedient to Christ. Right. There is another uh, scripture here, Colossians chapter 2. Starting in verse 8, it says, so Colossians 2, 8 says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceitful philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. And then we have Romans chapter 12. Let's see, I'll read verse might as well go ahead and read verse one as well. Verses one and two say this, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then Romans 12, two says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So brother Joe, do you have anything you want to say about those verses or add or at the outset mention? I think the word of God covers it, you know, and well, this, I will say this through the word of God, you know, it gives us basically a command to, you know, teach things that are false, you know, as far as coming up against it, like we're, we just don't sit back and just allow false teaching and false preaching just to go on and be like, well, you know, it's okay, you know, we're just going to pray for them and act like everything's, you know, happy, happy, joy, joy. There's many commands in the Bible where it talks about, you know, test every spirit because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So what we're doing isn't a sin. You know, I hear that all the time. People are like, you know, just pray for him. And, you know, how dare you touch God's anointed? And they, they take that one out of context, too, but um, which we may get into today. I don't know. But, yeah, there's we're commanded by God to, you know, cast down every, like I said, every argument, every imagination, every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, anything that is exalting against scripture, anything that is, you know, exalting itself against sound teaching. We need to rebuke that and expose it and bring it to light. So people aren't deceived. So this, this is our job. So for those of you who think it's not, (laughs) it is. Yeah. And you know, it's funny, you mentioned how you went to the Bible college. So you were in this movement for a while and then you kind of went to the way of the word. I guess I can't think of how to phrase it, but uh, so I have my Bible here, uh, my beat up old ESV study Bible. Um, And so, you know, you mentioned how you went to the word of God and you started deeply studying God's word and scripture and and really meditating on it, memorizing it, uh, marinating on it, um, try to use as much alliteration. What are some other M words that I could come up with? But, uh, (laughs) but yeah, so the emphasis was on, well, what does God really actually say? Right. And John 17, 17, Jesus prays in the garden, sanctify them uh, in the truth. Your word, scripture, the Bible is truth, Uh, right? We have second Timothy chapter for three verses 16 and 17, which says that all scripture is God breathed. I think the the Greek word there being theonoustos, God breathed. It's breathed out by God. It's useful for rebuke, uh, correction, for teaching, for training in righteousness, so that the servant of God 
is com competent, complete, uh, equipped for every good work. And so, you know, the word of God is our standard. It's not just a book. It's, it's the book. It's a special revelation from God. It is actually God's word. And that is our standard. And so I think that once people get into the word of God, um, uh, you know, I think they start realizing, wow, there's a lot of things in the world that do not line up with scripture. And yeah. that's really to be expected. At the same time, there's a lot of things in some uh, supposed churches and some supposed Christian movements that also are not in the word that we, we right. definitely need to call out. And there is a biblical imperative to do so. Uh, no one is going to come to your church and say, hi, I, my name is Mr. Wolf in sheep's clothing, and I'm here right. to preach a false message, right? That, that's not how it's going to happen. It's going to happen with, well, yeah, I believe this is the word of God. Of course I do. You know, and you mentioned how, you know, some of it sounds good. Some of it looks good. Uh, you know, the apostle Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? I believe that's Philippians four, or six and seven or something, maybe mm -hmm. I'm gosh, somewhere around there, but uh, you know, and people will take that verse out of context. People will take things like that. And, you know, they're not just going to say, Hey, Hey, this is a false teaching. Everybody beware of me. They're going to say, no, right. this is, this is the Bible verse says this, you know, God says, he Bible, wants to bless be us. yeah, yeah. That exactly like what you just said, brother, exactly that it's in the Bible. So therefore, you know, and what they'll do is they'll already have a, a presupposition that says, this is what I'm going to believe. This is what I'm going to teach. And here's the particular verse that goes with that, you know? And, and so uh, the other thought that I have is that, and so we, we have to be in our word. We have to be in the Bible and, and understanding, praying and, and, and seeking uh, truth, you know, Acts chapter 17, uh, the apostle Paul, I think verse 11, if I'm not mistaken, but the apostle Paul commends the Bereans as, uh, you know, most noble in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures to see if what was being said was true. So they looked through the word of God and they said, okay, well, let's line up what this person is saying with the word of God. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right to say that we are compelled. Uh, we we have to call out some false teaching. Now, we can do so in a loving way. Speak truth right. and love, Ephesians right. 4.15, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, verse 6 says, love does not rejoice in doing evil, but uh, in, rejoices in the truth. Um, right. And so, you know, we do so in a loving way. At the same time, we are called to do so. So do you have anything to add to that, brother? No, you nailed it. You know, well, that was great. That's exactly what we're called to do. All right. And so uh, I do want to throw this idea out there. And this is something I, I've kind of thought about as well. And one of the pushbacks, because you mentioned how we get pushback and we absolutely do. And that's to be expected, especially if you are a chaplain, uh, especially if you're a chaplain who happens to be on YouTube, have a YouTube channel. Um, I think anybody who puts themselves um, out there in the line of sight, so to speak, it, maybe maybe that's not a good way of phrasing them, but that you we have a target on us, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So I was in prison ministry for about five years and uh, that put a target on me, right? And then getting in front of a group of men uh, and helping minister to them and that sort of thing. I had I think the obvious Ephesians <clears throat> chapter six spiritual warfare thing is going on there. Um, but I think that we're, we're going to get criticism and that should be expected. Uh, but the main thing that I would ask that Christians do is that they stick to the Bible. In other words, not you're wrong because I say you're wrong or you're right. wrong because I have an opinion and I, I have some feelings and my feelings are anger against you because you're wrong. And you, you mentioned we get this all the time. Don't touch the Lord's anointed. That's, that's, you know, and it, it, it pains me because a lot of the pushback is just, it's not biblical. Like if, if, you know, as somebody who follows truth, right. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. John 14, six. I love quoting that because as Christians, we follow Jesus, which means we follow the truth. Um, and so if something's true, if somebody can come to me and say, here's what the Bible says, here's what you're saying the two are not matching up and mm -hmm. you're wrong because look here, then I can be like, yo, you're right. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. I repent of that. And I'm going to go with what you're saying because what you're saying is biblical. What I was saying was wrong. I'm fully okay with that. I think the problem we get is, is the unbiblical pushback, <laughs> you know, the don't touch the Lord's anointed and that sort of a thing. And I don't know if you've heard this, unless you want to add anything to that. I don't want to ramble on. Oh, I, I've heard it a lot when, yeah. When I first came out of the Word of Faith Prosperity Gospel Movement officially in 2011, and then I started and I repented of what I used to teach and stuff, and then I started teaching against it. Um, that was one of the number one things I heard was don't touch God's anointed. Well, there's so many problems with that. One, you're saying that 
teacher so-and-so is anointed and I'm not. Well, first of all, the Bible says we're all anointed in 1 John 2. So there is no like superior anointings. There is no, he's a great man of God or woman of God. And you're just some peasant peon on the bottom totem pole. That's not how it works in the body of Christ. So first of all, we have a wrong way of thinking about how the anointing, this hierarchy of anointing, which just doesn't exist. But then number two, they use touch not God's anointed as a means to silence people from speaking the truth. So even if you are speaking the truth, it doesn't matter. They will use that as a means to silence you so the wolf can keep doing what they're doing because they're so deceived into what the wolf or the false teacher, false prophet is saying that they don't want to have anybody come up against their, their hero, if you will. So consequently, even if your hero is doing dirt or preaching dirt, they'll use don't touch God's anointed as a means to silence you, even if what you're saying is true. Um, so they're so deceived into the wolf message that, and then, then the labels will start coming. Well, you're just a troublemaker. You're just, you know, you're bringing, they use that other biblical verse, you know, you're just the accuser of the brethren, even though that was reserved for Satan, or they'll say, you know, you're the one who stirs up strife. You know, you're, you're the one who's, you know, the, the stir up of the, of the, of the church and you're a troublemaker and you're rebellious and you just don't, you don't want to submit to authority. That's your problem. Um, and I'm like, you're right. I don't want to submit to the authority when the authority is wrong and they're abusive and they're not quoting scripture correctly and they're teaching false doctrine and they're leading people astray. Yeah, I don't want to submit to that authority. And if, I, if I'm a husband and a father, which I am, no, I don't want to submit my family to that garbage either. So why, you're right. Why would I want to? But you get labeled every name under the book um, trying to do what's right for you and your family. And they use scriptures like don't touch God's anointed to silence you. And then eventually they'll just push you out the church because you're that rebellious person that doesn't want to submit. So you had to go because you were basically, you know, hindering the church in some way. And then so and they and they even might, you know, they even might shine it up real nice and say, you know, we sent brother Joe off. You know, he we have his blessing to go off. The reality is, is you kicked me out the door. So, but they'll put a positive spin on it and make it sound like they're so loving and nice and all that, but they won't tell you basically, Hey, you got into a big argument, you know, a couple of weeks ago and how I, I was the, 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 you know, the cause of all the division and strife and all that. But the reality is, is you didn't want to humble yourself and look at the mirror. So it's just, it, it goes, you know, anyway, I could talk about that forever, but yeah. No, oh, brother, that was worded very articulately uh, and very well, I think, because you said a lot there, and I think it's 100% correct. Absolutely. First off, I want to touch on some of the things you said, hero worship, this idolatrous, almost yep. hero worship, where you're putting a man or a woman or a person up on a pedestal, up on a platform where they do not deserve to be, where only Jesus Correct. ought to be. Amen. And so, you know, we get this with him, you know, and listen, man, I, I, when I was growing up, Ken Griffey Jr. was my favorite baseball player. I even tried to bat like him. Um, I tried to hit home runs like him, but I'm not King Griffey Jr. I'm not the best baseball player of all time or, you know, and when I was a kid, that's, you know, anyway, um, besides the point, I'm just using his, him as an example, but even King it. Griffey Jr. struck out from time to time, right? He would hit pop flies. Um, he didn't win all the home run derbies and that sort of a thing. So there really cannot be um, anyone, especially spiritually speaking, um, you know, who we put on a platform like that, other than Jesus Christ himself. Now we can uh, have yeah. adoration, I think, for people. Uh, we can really appreciate work that people have done. Uh, I love, you know, what Vody Bauckham does when he preaches. I think he, he does a, a really good job. Um, I love people like yourself. I already mentioned at the outset of this video, hey, you're a chaplain, you have 100%, you have my respect. You're a military veteran, you've been deployed, 100%, you have my respect. You're a brother in Christ, you have my respect. You're a dad, you have my respect. You're a husband, you have my respect, I love you all that good stuff. I could sing your praises. However, I can't sing your praises in the way that I sing the praises of Lord and Savior, my Lord and Savior, right. Jesus Christ. Right. Amen. So that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think you would appreciate that, you know, and I'm, I'm the same way. That's why, you know, many times I take compliments in much the same way that I would take critiques because, right. you know, I don't want to put my emphasis on what man thinks about me. I want to be more concerned about what God thinks about me. And I appreciate anybody saying, Hey, great video, or I think you're doing good or whatever. But the last thing that I would want anybody to do is put me on any sort of platform or Correct. pedestal 
that I don't deserve to be on because I'll be the first one to tell you I'm the worst sinner that I know. I don't know anybody that's a worse sinner than me. And I've done prison ministry and I have known some dudes that have done some bad stuff, you know, so I'm only saved by the grace of God. Um, and so you're right to talk about this, this hero worship that I think we're all guilty from time to time, but they're the touch, not the Lord's anointed people mm. really are in danger of really Id- making an idol out of their, their, whoever their said preferred pastor is. Yep. And then another thing you mentioned, I think, is sort of this ad hominem uh, character attack type thing, right? So who are you? Uh, Incorporated along with the hero worship, there's often this character attack of the person who's trying to take down their idol. Um, In other words, you know, who do you think you are to say something about this person? Um, You're just this lowly, this like, you're just doing it for subs. You're just doing it for views. You're, you know, and and that sort of thing. And it's like, well, what do you even talk? Like, (laughs) you don't know me. Like, what are you talking about? Like, (laughs) I'm just saying what the Bible's saying. You're over here talking about how bad a guy I am. (laughs) I'm the worst thing since, you know. Um, you stepping in that bubble gum on the hot pavement today. And, you know, I I mean, I'm not that bad, but, you know, I mean, I'm not a quote unquote good person, but I ain't that bad, you know. Um, So there's often this character attack that I think is, goes along with that. And the other thing too, I think um, that I found, you said a lot of other good things too. I can't think of off the top of my head to respond to you, but so much what you said, I think resonates with me and a lot of other people that have channels or that or have quote unquote discernment ministries or whatnot, where they're trying to discern what's the, the what's the right thing to do. Um, this hero worship, the, the character attacks um, and all that sort of a thing. One of the things that, uh, I don't know if you mentioned this, but one of the things that I found is that people will often say, um, you know, and, and you, I think this goes with what you're saying because people, people will often say, okay, well, you have to look at the, the whole body of work. You have to look at what all it is that they do. Um, so maybe they're doing good here. Maybe they're mm-hmm. altruistic in the community. Well, they're doing good things. Look at here. They did this good yep. thing for the community. They fed the homeless or whatever. <clears throat> and the example that I like to try to use is the example of the cheating husband who happens to be a pastor let's the, the horrible example but it, it happens it right. certainly People happens get, let's say, right. absolutely you know and, and you can have a pastor who let's say 23 hours of the day he does amazing work he works on his sermon he's a, a great husband well i guess he's not a great husband if he's cheating but let's say 23 hours out of the day he's a great husband a provider uh, let's say he's the great dad. Let's say he feeds the homeless. Let's say he blesses the people at his church and does great service, et cetera, et cetera. You could go on with all these yep. accolades, but let's say that one hour out of each day, he goes off to a hotel and has an adulterous affair. Okay. Well, that's, that's what one 24th of his day. Right. Um, <clears throat> Right. I mean, that's a very small amount of time that he's doing that. You know, it's just it's an affair once a day. You know, it's just one hour out of 23, 23 other hours. The guy's a saint, you know, and it's like, well, you got to look at the whole body of work. Like he's telling the gospel. He's doing all this. You know, why, why would you focus? Oh, the divisive, the division. That's what you said. So why would you why would you focus on his adulterous affair? Like he right. was just feeding the homeless. He was just, dude, like he just gave 500 bucks so that this mom of single mom with three kids can keep the lights on. What? That's a good man. He's a great man, you know? And it's like, well, listen, I, I listen, he's altruistic. Check that box. He's good dad to his kids. Check that box. All fine and well, that's fine. But the word of God says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Right. Um, you should not be committing adultery. You should not be doing that. You know, and as, in particular, as a pastor, you know, there are higher standards um, for you. I think James uh, 3 verse 1 says, not many of you should be teachers because right. you'll be held to a higher standard. And so, you know, you bring up scripture and you bring up Bible. And oftentimes what happens, I think, is that you point to the divisive thing that's happening and you say, hey, look at here. Here's something that's happening. I'm literally pointing to it right now. I have evidence, I have facts, and I have a Bible, right? Um, So I know what the Word of God says. I know what this person is saying. I know what they're doing. I can point to it. And for some reason, I'm the one that's being divisive. For some reason, I'm the one that's stirring the pot. I'm the Mm -hmm. one that's causing division. So I would say to that, I would say, you know, it's not the people who are calling out the false teaching. It's not the people who are pointing to it and saying, look, there it is. 
rather it's the people who are because they're speaking truth, right? It's it's not it's not going to be the person who is speaking the truth who is going to be the one who's being quote unquote divisive. It's the people who are antithetical to truth and and trying to undermine that person speaking truth who are the ones being divisive, right? So if I have a pastor, let's say I had a pastor in my hypothetical scenario, I would be obligated, like we mentioned earlier, I would be compelled, right. you know, to say, hey, listen, love the guy, he does great work, great man, 23 hours of the day, that one hour of the day, I consistently see him because I work in this building and I see him going into that room with this lady every single day for one hour. <laughs> a horrible example, but I'm sure it happens, you know, and, and so it wouldn't, it would not make me the one stirring the pot or causing division to call out that pastor and say, right. here's why he's wrong. Um, it would make me the right one doing the right thing, you know, and I can do that out of love. I don't need to go punch him in the face and tackle him and you know, right. beat them up with a, a baseball bat and say, got them, you know, <laughs> you know, I don't need to, you know, curb stomp them or nothing insane like that. But I mean, I, I ha- I'm obligated to call them out, you know what I mean? So uh, that's the pushback that we get, though, you know, you're being divisive and that sort of thing. So I rambled on so much there. Do you want to add anything to that? Or Well, yeah, well, just on that, even if, like, say you don't have proof, but you're just asking questions. Um, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, pastor preached this, but the word says this type of thing. Um, in a lot of these circles, you're not even, you're not even allowed to be inquisitive. Um, if you even ask questions, you'll get the whole, who are you to question the man of God as if somehow I'm, I'm not a man of God, or you're not a woman of God. Well, and if you're, if you're saved, you are, and you have a right, you have a Bible and you have a right to, you know, rightly divide the word of truth, just like everybody else. And, you know, this whole hierarchy of, you know, they're above you, you know, like you talked about earlier, you know, who are you to question so-and-so? Well, are you saying um, nobody? And that's, a, that's essentially what you're saying is, you know, and this is another thing I, I've done a couple of videos on my channel where in the body of Christ, people have made the mistake of thinking super famous means super anointed. So consequently, the more anointed you are, the more famous you are, the more famous you are, then, then you're somebody because you've arrived. And if you only if you only have, you know, a couple hundred likes or whatever on YouTube and you're just some YouTube guy, well, then you're like a scumbag Christian. You're you're inferior to the men of God who's pastoring 10,000. And I'm like, show me that in the Bible where it says that, um, you know, some of the most, you know, powerful prophets or whatever in the Bible were somebody that we don't even know who they were, you know, if, as far as you know, name and prestige and all that, but yet they had a powerful message. So it's not about the person, it's about the message God gave them. And so many people, they, they, they think, well, since you don't have a big platform, then obviously you must be a nobody in the kingdom. Um, and that's just simply not true. I mean, great example of that is when Nathan rebuked King David. Well, King David was the king, you know? And Nathan's like, guess what, David? You're still that dude who did wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? Your crown is irrelevant. Now, thankfully, David repented. He realized what the truth that Nathan was saying, and David repented. Um, and there was consequences and stuff to his sin. But, you know, David's crown meant nothing, you know. But if that were happening in our church today, they'd be like, how dare you come up against the king? How dare you come up against the man of God? How dare you come? Don't you know he defeated Goliath? Don't you know that our military is more powerful than we've ever been? Look at all the people that he defeated. We're a national power. Look at King David today. And Nathan's like, David, you're still the dude. You're still that dude that, you know, slept with Bathsheba and killed, you know, Uriah, her husband. You're still that dude. <laughs> you know? None of those accolades meant anything. David still got rebuked. And now let's fast forward to the New Testament. I mean, Paul rebuked Peter, you know, and said, you know, basically, Peter, what is with this two-facedness? You know, when you're with the Jews, you're hanging out with the Jews. When you're with the Gentiles, you're hanging out with the Gentiles. But then when the Jews come by, you act like you're, you're you know, you don't want to have anything to do with them because you're afraid of offending your Jewish friends. Like, no, five minutes ago, you were straight. But now you're like, oh, I'm not going to do that now. And the, the Bible says, and, and Paul rebuked him to his face. Now, wait a minute. Peter walked with Jesus for three years. You know, Peter walked on water with Jesus. Nobody else can say that. Peter's like, I'm the water walker. Who are you to talk to me? And Paul's like, I don't care. You're wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when you're wrong, there is no, you're better than me. I'm lesser than you. You don't see that anywhere in scripture. So it's just this, this hierarchy, this false hierarchy that we've built. You know, I tell people all the time, truth is truth. It doesn't matter the vessel that it comes in. Truth is truth. But we have equated fame with anointing. And therefore, if you're not as famous, you must not carry as much anointing. And therefore, you're somehow inferior Christian. 
And that's just simply not true. Amen, brother. There's a lot there. And those are awesome biblical points. And, and it goes back to what I had mentioned earlier, right? So as followers of the truth, as followers of Jesus, when something's true and it's pointed out to us that it's true, our posture is not, oh, I'm right. right. <laughs> like, I'm still right. And you're still wrong. I don't care what you say. Nanny, nanny, boo. You know, that's childish. That's immature, right? Now, if maybe if you're a baby Christian and, you know, you just come to the Lord and yesterday and, <laughs> you know, you're still in that mindset where, like, you're, you're prideful and whatnot. And we can all be prideful from time to time. I'm not saying I can't. You know, I'm, I'm right. definitely oh, yeah. stubborn. Absolutely. Like I said, I'm the worst sinner I know. However, when something's true, we, our posture ought to be, you're right. That's right. And you're right because it's true. It's, it's objective. It's outside of me. It doesn't matter. My opinion, what were yours, frankly, it it matters. Right. What does God say? What, what's reality? What actually happened? And you're absolutely right. Nathan, the prophet, right. He says, you're the dude. I like that translation. That's the, (laughs) uh, the new, uh, Joe translation right there. But uh, yeah, you are the man, you are the dude, right? Like, and, and David didn't say, if anybody could say, hey, I'm the Lord's anointed, it, right. it would have been David, like, it totally would have been him, right. you know, he could have been like, oh, touch thou not the, the Lord's anointed, you know, get out, miss me with that, get out of here, you know, and, and you mentioned Peter, right, with uh, Paul, uh, I think that's Galatians too, and, and yeah. so he, he approaches him to his face publicly, you know, and it's not like, You know, Peter could have definitely been like, I am the Lord's anointed. Don't you know, I am like the rock that the God, you know, Jesus said, I'll build this church on, you know, don't you know my name? I was in the upper room. I I gave the first. Right. (laughs) Right. Like, who do you think you are? You are Saul of Tarsus. You were killing us back in the day, you know, I mean, just the gosh, you know, and, and so if anybody could have ever used those arguments, it would have been them, um, but they didn't because That's correct. They, they were followers of the truth, you know, and so truth matters, truth matters. And I think, you know, again, there's this dry, cold, uh, cold hearted way that we can speak the truth that is unloving and uncaring and sounds unkind. Um, and then there's the, which I think there's, there's opposite extremes that that may be an opposite extreme. That's all about truth. No love. It's to- totally right. disconnected with love. And that's bitter, harsh, cold, and that sort of thing, which is kind of comes off as nasty because kind of is, <laughs> yeah. you know, and being unloving is, is not following Christ, right? At the same time, there's the the opposite extreme that's like all about love, 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 love mm-hmm. is love. And we can all just hold hands, sing Kumbaya and, and share a, a heart shaped red blow up balloon, you know, and everything's okay. Um, and so that, and so we, we just want to love people and we just want to affirm them and whatever it is they're doing and whatever it is they're saying and, and love affirms all things, you know, not, you know, it's, it's, it's bizarre. Are and and so there's there's a, a middle ground happy medium yep. I think where it's like well hold up you know yeah we need to be loving of course um, love absolutely sure um, at the same time we have to speak truth and they're not mutually exclusive they're two different sides of the same coin I go to my doctor my doctor loves me he's gonna say hey your leg's broken you know <laughs> he's not gonna say hey I know his leg's broken but you know, gosh, just give them these crutches and, and tell them, take it easy, take Tylenol, you know, like, right. what is that? What good does that do me? I have a broken leg. Like, what are we going to do? Let's, let's fix it or something. Um, right. Terrible example, uh, Lord willing, <laughs> I don't break my leg. Um, so I, I misquoted Philippians earlier. So Philippians four, six, and seven, I have uh, had that memorized for a while. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What I was trying to quote was Philippians 4.13. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him or through Christ who strengthens me. And so I think that's a good segue into, because I mean, gosh, we could spend hours talking about all the many different things, uh, you know, and that's the amazing thing, right? So there's so many things in here in my own heart, so many things in here in my own head that I have to contend with as far as spiritual warfare. And I know a lot of people don't like the, especially, you know, it brings back memories and and bad memories for a lot of military people. And, you know, um, gosh, just, you know, I know the war language is not uh, nice language, nice sounding language. But I mean, we have as Christians to realize that we truly are in a war every day and there's spiritual war that goes on in ourselves that we need to fight, <clears throat> excuse me, Luke 9, 23, take up your cross and deny yourself. Um, right. We, we all should be doing that daily. Um, and so that takes the fight. That's a spiritual war. At the same time, there's 
outward things that are in the world that are also contending, that are fighting with us, that are trying to come inside um, ourselves and in the church. Um, so there's so many of those things. Uh, but just piggybacking off that verse in Philippians chapter four, verse 13, and, and how you had mentioned that uh, you were kind of involved in more of a health, wealth, and, and prosperity kind of right, way yeah. of thinking. There are some things I would say, and, and that's why I say, you know, a lot of times the lies are sprinkled with just enough truth, right? Like God right. does love us. Absolutely. God wants to bless us. Sure. Absolutely. Philippians 4.13, it, it does say that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. I think that's definitely ripped out of context, but totally. uh, to support the health, wear, wealth, and, and prosperity gospel. But uh, why don't we talk a little bit about that? Because that definitely, and, and where that goes sideways, you know, and what mm-hmm. ways, do, what ways do they kind of get it right? And you're like, well, that sounds right. That, that is right. But what ways do they just crash and burn and, and get it way off and it, it goes off the rails, would you say? Two, well, I think there's two main things that they do. One, the whole word of faith part of it is the whole name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, speak it into existence thing. That's that's the first thing, which leads to this theology of we're gods with a small g, right? So they basically believe, for instance, when it says in First John 4, it says, just like Jesus is, so are we in the world, Right. Well, they take that to mean, well, basically, whatever Jesus did, I can do it too. So if Jesus walked on water, I can walk on water. If Jesus said, hey, Peter, go down and catch a fish and there'll be a pearl or there'll be a coin in his mouth and I can speak that and there'll be a coin in my wallet. You know, I can just, you know, money cometh to me now type of thing, you know, Kenneth Copeland and all those other guys. And so I just want to interrupt real quick and say that that is a real thing. He said, like, I never knew, like, I'm finding out about a lot of this stuff just being on YouTube. Like, I had no idea how bad it was, but that is a real thing. Money now, like, yeah, money comes to me. That was like just just people making fun of it, but it's real. It's real. And and the reason I know that, because just to give you an idea of where I was coming from, that was kind of like my spiritual tree. Like it was. I had a father in the faith and then he had a bishop and then his bishop was Creffel Dollard and his fierce father was Kenneth Copeland and his spiritual father was either Kenneth Aiken Sr. or Orr Roberts, I guess, depending on who you talk to. And Orr Roberts is all about that, you know, seed faith. If you have a need, sow a seed. And apparently the only seed you can sow was money. You can't sow anything else, apparently. But that's how it was. So they were they were always about the giving, giving, giving. If you have a problem, if, you know, throw, throw some money at it, basically, is what the theology was. So they didn't really teach a lot of stewardship. It was always give your way out of problems. It wasn't, you know, be more mature, be a good steward over your finances, you know, learn the keys to good finances. It was always, if you got a problem, if your marriage is terrible, if your money's terrible, if your kids are terrible, if your job is terrible, if everything's terrible, you fix all of it by giving more money. And so, and well, anyway, so that was part of the prosperity as- aspect of it. So those are the two, to answer your questions, those are the two ways where it just got out of whack. It was the prosperity gospel and money cometh to me. And then that's how they, they got intertwined. You know, you can speak money into your life is what they would teach. You can speak anything in your life. You can speak promotion. You can speak a husband or a husband or a wife. You can speak children. You can speak jobs and you can speak whatever. Um, and it all goes to this you know, so Jesus is, so are we in the world. But in context there, it was talking about future judgment. And it was talking about, because it says perfect love cast out fear. Well, how come, how come we don't have fear? Because it says when we're being judged, we're, we, we're going to be found in Christ, right? So just like Christ is in the world, so are we, because just like God loved the Father, he loves us like that because we are in him. So it's not about, you know, I can do whatever Jesus did, right? But that's how they take it. So they, so when they read Genesis, they're looking through that lens. So it says, you know, when God said, let there be light, there was light. They're like, well, I can do whatever God does because I'm a, I'm a God. So I can say, let their promotion be promotion. And it's got to happen because the powers in the atmosphere. And that's another thing too. When they say these things, I'm like, who exactly are you talking to? Right. When they say like, you know, I, I speak to my morning, you know, Monday morning, I command you to give me prosperous. Okay. Who's Monday morning? Like who exactly is the power in the atmosphere that you're you're speaking to? Who exactly are you commanding? Who are you having to speak to your Monday morning? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is really sad because you just read it. Philippians 4, 6, it says, if you have a request, let your petitions be known unto God, right? Well, if I can speak it into existence, I don't make requests anymore. I don't actually pray anymore. Demand. You demand and 
and they that's something it, they say, isn't it? Like the oh, yeah. and the creed or something. They, they well, they don't call it commanding; they call it confessing, and not like confessing like "Bless me, Father, for I have sinned," like Catholic confession, like confession, like the power of your words confession. So it, it's no longer let your request and supplication be known unto God. It's sickness i bind you in the name of jesus and i command you to dry up and blah 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 so you don't ask, you don't even ask god anymore like the whole idea of asking god for anything is thrown out the window there is no asking it's you now tell it to do whatever you're saying well here's the other problem with that is because you're never factoring in the will of god like the sovereignty of god in the will of god is a mockery absolutely mockery in these these, I can't even say denominations, they're more like movements. Because, you know, the Bible says in 1 John 5, it says, this is the confidence that we have. If we ask, keyword, ask anything in his will, that we have the confidence that God hears us, then it says, and then we will have whatever we say. So we'll have what we say when we ask according to his will. But that's not what they teach. They teach, I just say it in the power in the atmosphere or Satan or whoever has to do whatever I bid, even God himself, because God had, and then they say this, God has to back up his word. Exactly. That's the Bible, not me. Right? I'm not the word of God, but they basically twist that as well to where I can name it and claim it. I can blab it and grab it. I can speak anything I want into existence just because I want it. It has nothing to do with what God actually said or what God's will is. So that's the first problem that they screw up. And then the second problem is, is, is they take these prosperity scriptures. For that's example, a really big problem, by the way. That's, that's oh, not yeah. a little problem. That's a big problem. So that oh, yeah. alone, well, but... It's a huge problem because that first problem is about idolatry because it's about the worship of self. And it's blasphemy because now you're putting your position where God is supposed to be. So that first one is a big problem because it's idolatrous and blasphemous, right? But the second problem is you taking scriptures out of context like prosperity right? Uh, like there's, there's, a, there's a psalm, I think it's Psalm 34, I could be wrong, but it says, the, the, the Lord delights in the prosperity of his servant, okay? Prosperity preachers, they love to quote that one. Well, in the, in the original Hebrew, that word prosperity there means shalom, which is peace, right? And if you read that psalm, that, that verse is in there, that whole entire psalm is about David basically praying for peace from his enemies, that's what that whole entire psalm was about. There's no finances in there. There's no financial wealth in there. That, that verse has nothing to do with money or your wallet or your bank accounts or anything like that. It's talking about having peace from one's enemies because the word is shalom. Um, so they don't study it in the Hebrew and the Greek. They don't find out what the original language was. Therefore, they don't get the right context. But they'll just say, see, the, the Lord wants us to be prosperous. And he wants you to be hog, basically hog nasty wealthy, which goes into the New Apostolic Reformation a little bit. That's why... I was speaking to Alicia Childers the other day because she came to Raleigh a couple of weeks ago and I was telling her this. I said, you know, the prosperity gospel in the NAR, they're basically like, you know, twins, but they have the same parents because they have the same spiritual DNA running through them. And that is basically worldly dominion or worldly takeover through Christ. But the prosperity gospel says worldly takeover through money. Because they say, well, you know, if we own everything, then we can own Hollywood, and we can own politics, and we can own the government, and we can own, you know, entertainment, we can own the media, and we can own education. There's like, in the NAR, they have like seven mountains of influence well, or whatever. It's kind of like their own money and power too, right? Correct. Like that's one part of the reasons why it's so prideful because it's like their their own power and their own clout because that's why a lot oftentimes they'll it'll be accompanied with titles right apostle so-and-so or whatever correct sorry to interrupt but no so that so that that's what happens now there is some truth to this like the lord desires for his people to be blessed and there's nothing wrong with being healed there's nothing wrong with walking in you know health there's nothing wrong with christians having money i mean in and of itself it's not a sin um, it's, it's what we do with it. It's, it's how we covetousness, if we prideful with it, we think we're better if we don't share and we don't care about people and all this other stuff and stuff. So there's nothing wrong in and of itself with having money. So we look at that and we're like, oh yeah, that's gotta be true. But it's the way that they take it. It's just completely foreign to what the scriptures actually teach. And they teach it at such an unhealthy level then it becomes prideful and arrogant because then they start talking about, well, and then, then they really start bringing your salvation into it 
in, in the sense of, well, I, I'm saved now. So in God is, you know, Jesus is the King of King and Lord of Lords. That means I, I'm a child of the King. So since I'm a child of the King, you know, I'm royalty. So since I'm royalty, I'm supposed to walk in lavishness. I'm supposed to walk in money. I'm supposed to walk in Mercedes Benz. I'm so, as a, I mean, I'm supposed to have a private jet because I'm a child of the King. Now Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. <laughs> right? So and they, and they failed to realize that all the original disciples, the first disciples, except for one, I think were martyred. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Apostle Paul was shipwrecked and homeless and, right. you know. Yeah, so all the suffering. And just like when, when God spoke to Ananias, when the angel spoke to Ananias and said, hey, go and see Paul, who's at the end. And then he says, when you go see Paul, tell him all the suffering that he will suffer for my namesake. So I tell people all the time, part of Paul's calling was suffering. But they don't prosperity gospel people, word of faith people, they don't want to hear that because they think I can speak my suffering away. I can tell my suffering to go and therefore my suffering has to go. So anything I don't want, I can just tell it to go. Well, that's totally uh, contrary to scripture too, because I believe it's in second Peter where it's either first Peter, second Peter, I keep getting this confused where it says, it says, after you have suffered a while, you'll basically be made perfect. There being made mature, lacking nothing. So one of the ways in which we grow up and we walk into Christian maturity is by going through suffering, going through pain. It's not getting out of stuff. It's about how we can go in through things through Christ. That's how we mature. It's not about, you know, and all the stuff so ironic. from. It's so ironic because the same people that wrote those texts, right? Obviously, we know and dwelt by God, the Holy Spirit. This is God's word spoken through men. Uh, but those same men that had to write those verses, the same men that wrote those verses down, uh, that God used to write those down, proclaiming those things were also the same men that were talking to suffering Christians, that they right. themselves were suffering. So it is just so ironic that people read those and come to the conclusion, the bizarre conclusion that this means health, wealth, and prosperity for me. And I'm, right. you know. Well, to your, to your point, there is some aspect of truth. And like we said earlier, you know, it is in the Bible, but they, they twist it. Like for instance, Romans 8, 30, 8, 31, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And it says, you know, if God before us, who can be against us? But then Paul lists all the stuff we may go through, like death, nor life, no angels, no principalities, and all those things, are, you know, the persecutions and sufferings, no peril or sword. No, nothing should be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Meaning, as Christians, we may be called to go through all those things. And that's why we're more than conquerors, because we're more than conquerors, because we may have to go through them things. You can't conquer anything if you don't do anything. Right. So that's what Paul was saying. We're more than conquerors, but we're more than conquerors in all of these things, not the absence of these things, but in all of these things. So, yeah, who, if God be for us, who can be against us? Yeah. As we're going through this suffering. But they just quote the if God be for me, who can be against me? Right. And they take that and see, I can do whatever I want and I can have all the money I want and I can, you know, have my private jets and have my cake and eat it, too, because that's what the verse is saying. No, that verse is talking about having hope and encouragement and God having our backs through all this mess that we may have to go through. But the, the mess part, they don't want to preach that. Amen, so, brother. They want to focus on the, the Romans 8, 28 part, right? Like God yeah. works all things out to, to right. the good of those who love him and everything's for my good and, and that sort of a thing. <clears throat> this is a true story. And I love how you, you put all that together because you mentioned both the, the aspects of there is some truth to it. And yeah. I think that's what makes it so, and you know, you mentioned the Bible says it and it does, it you does, know, yeah. and so there's aspects of it that make it uh, seem right or sound right. And again, no one's just going to be like, yo, yo, I'm, I'm here for the false teaching. And that's, that's right. what I'm here to do. You know, right. Hey, I'm here to take those dollars, you know? And I, well, some people won't, some people will outright say I'm here to take your dollars. And for whatever reason, you know, um, Creflo dollar, <laughs> you know, I, I hate the job, but you know, some people will say that I, I shouldn't say not all people will do that, but for sure. I, you know, I, I think as a general rule, when it comes to false teaching, nobody just outright says I'm a false teacher, right? They, they right. give a little bit of truth, just sprinkle it enough to where people will be like, well, yeah, maybe question it and whatnot. And, you know, at the same time, they, they, they butcher scripture and, and twist it up this is a true story with uh, my prison ministry that I was involved with. Um, so uh, funny, funny story. So I almost was close to not being involved when, with it when I first got into it, because one of the things that they would do is they would go over books. Now, obviously, we brought our Bibles, we go over Bible studies and that sort of a thing. 
at the same time, there were various books that we would go through and, and, and each book had like a time frame, like three months, we're going to go over this book, three mm-hmm. months, this book, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> excuse me. And one of the books was a Joyce Meyer book, surprisingly. Now you would not think in a, a male uh, detention center, a uh, prison where men are going to be they they would hand out a Joyce Meyer book. You wouldn't think that, but they did. And so that was one of the books that we had to go over. And, you know, it gave me pause when I first got into the prison ministry thing, because I was like, why are we going over? Like, this is Joyce Meyer. She's got some very questionable teachings. I've mm-hmm. heard a lot about her. Now this was, gosh, this was now at this point, 10 years ago. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been a little while and this is prior to, to me really knowing too much about Joyce Meyer and never really followed her too much, but I had heard some things and, and watched some of the stuff that she'd said, and it just didn't strike me the right way. Right. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, eh, I'm kind of questionable about her. Um, but as I read through her book that we had to go through, I, I forget the name of the book, but anyway, read through her book, a lot of the stuff that she did, and you mentioned how they would take scripture out of context. And that's definitely, and I think she, I think it's fair to say that Joyce Meyer is one of the health, wealth, and prosperity promoters. So, yeah. And, and, you know, and, and what she would do is she would always, when she did quote scripture, and I appreciated the quoting scripture, I always appreciate when somebody quotes scripture, because it's God's word, you're right, you know, it's in the Bible. Uh, at the same time, we have to be very careful how we quote it and in context and that sort of thing. I, I love right. how Greg Kokel, uh, uh, apologist says never read a Bible verse because you know he doesn't mean don't read the Bible he means don't read that single verse and isolate it and right. on its own and, and butcher it right. and yeah and and that's what Joyce Meyer would do so I brought up on my my phone here it says uh, a Proverbs eighteen verse twenty one but what she would do a lot of times is she would do like verse uh, twenty one verse uh, a letter a or something and she would like make it clear that she's chopping it up like one verse and not even quoting the full verse in its entirety. And so Proverbs 18, 21 says the tongue has the power of life and death comma, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And so in other words, in context, essentially what it's saying is you should be careful. James uh, also points back to Proverbs and the context is you should watch your mouth watch basically, your mouth. right? You shouldn't right. run your mouth. Right. Um, and we should know that. Yeah. I shouldn't just flippantly run my mouth. I should be considered and, and understand that my words, I can, once I say them, I can't take them back. I, I could say the New York giants are the best football team. And if I say that I'm going to offend some Dallas Cowboys fans and that sort of a thing. And so, you know, that's kind of a, a silly example. Um, but if I were to say something really wild, you know, it'd be stupid. And, and the Proverbs tells me not to say that sort of a thing. And so what what she would do is she would take like she would write uh, Proverbs 1821a and then she would say the tongue has the power of life and death therefore with your tongue you can like you were saying Stinky. name it claim it uh, yep. what blab it what'd you say blab it blab it and grab, grab it, it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the blab <laughs> blab it grab it is it's such a better way of saying it but yeah the, this was her proof text quote right. unquote proof text to to prove what she was saying right all of you them know, use the tongue. that by the way that, that all of them do all yeah of them and it's just like yeah. You know, and what I did in the uh, in the prison was uh, I used it in a subversive manner because I would say, "Hey, this is what's wrong." With it. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure if uh, some of the people appreciate it, but um, you know, one of the things that I would do because it was one of the books that we kind of had to go over, and uh, I would point out and I would tell the guys, Hey, this is our standard. This is the Bible. Um, that's what we go to. And we need to read verses in context and you guys need to be aware because part of the prison ministry I was involved in was the guys to be in the program. The guys had to be within a year of being released back into society. And so it was basically meant to, um, help them when they get back into society. And many of the guys did great when they got out. They were better husbands, better dads, got jobs, went to school, all these other stuff. And then there were some guys that, you know, I would see a week later, hey, I'm, I'm back in, you know, unfortunately. But, you know, one of the things I did going over this book was I would say, you know, here's a good example of what not to do. What she's doing is what you don't want to do because she's taking it out of context. And, you know, we would talk about different things. And I think in a way it was good to go over those books just to hear what the other side has to say. Um, the unfortunate thing about it was that there were some people who were more into that movement who would read that and say, no, she's right. You can name right. it, claim it, you know? And then it's like, you know, it wasn't supposed to be a, a debate class. So it's like, as the person who's kind of facilitating and, and leading the, the study, it's, you know, you don't want to be up there being a 
jerk and like, no, you're wrong. <laughs> you know, here's, right. you know, so there, there were some times where it got a little like that, but anyway, the point being that you're absolutely right. They, they twist scripture and take it out of context and it, it's right to point to the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. The Bible says it at the same time, it has to be done in proper context and that sort of thing. So anything to add to that or well, just to give you an example, kind of, I have the same situation. Uh, Dr. Leroy Thompson, he has a book out called money cometh to the body of Christ. And he's, he's had that book out for a while, probably about 15, 20 years or so now. Well, one of his proof texts, one of his big texts is the Lord delights in the prosperity of a servant, which again, we just talked about the word prosperity there means shalom, which means peace. So he's got a whole entire book about money coming to the body of Christ. And yet the verses he uses to prove it have nothing to do with what his book's actually about. So you can literally create a whole entire theology off of taking scripture out of context. And in this case, write a whole entire book and sell it on Amazon and make a whole bunch of money about selling basically a false book that has nothing to do with what that scripture actually is talking about. Um, which again leads to him having Mercedes and private jets and all that. Cause he's like, see, I did it. So therefore it has to be true. And I'm like, yeah, it has to be true because you're on the top of the pyramid scheme, buddy. That's why it worked. You know, all these people are tithing to you or giving to you and you know, all the money's going to you. So of course prosperity works when, you know, you consider yourself to be the good ground and then they're sowing into the good ground, which is really you or whatever. And then all the money goes to you. If you're on top of the pyramid, of course it works for you. Um, but the people on the bottom of the pyramid don't get anything. So, you know, but, you know, you, but then that's another thing that they do. They show people their jets and their Mercedes and their houses and all that to say, look, it has to be true because look how this happened for me. Not realizing, yeah, it happened for you because, you know, you basically were getting all this off the backs of the Christians who had pain. You know, they were sowing money because, you know, they were their loved ones had cancer or they had COVID or they had AIDS or they were, you know, crippled in wheelchairs and all that. So they were giving, hoping that they would get healed or their loved one would get healed. So you're literally would take advantage of people's pain, which is just sick. Um, and just, and the fact that you were using God's word to do that makes it even more sicker. Um, but yeah, I mean, so that's what would happen. So they would just, you know, take these verses, like you said, you just can't take a verse and say, this is what the Bible says. Yeah, that's what it says, but what does it mean? And in order to find out what that means is you got to get the proper context because anybody can quote a verse and say, that's what the Bible says, but is it quoted in context? And you'll find that a lot of these guys and gals don't quote it in context at all. And then they go write books about it. They have nothing to do with what that verse is actually talking about. Amen, brother. I think you're absolutely right there. You know, it always reminds me of this clip that I, I will never get out of my head of Kenneth Copeland and Inside Edition. I think it was Inside Edition when they like, um, cornered him and like <laughs> surprised him out of nowhere and like hey why don't you want to fly commercial you know why are you on a private jet and kenneth copeland she kenneth copeland like man it was almost like a demon possession i'm not I'm his not eyes got like, all demonic looking man, yeah yeah and he was like don't you ever i was like whoa that's insane yeah. like yeah. what in the world you know and let alone that people still even you know i, I would have thought you know hey that that video went viral people seen it and and they synced it and, and they're done with them now, you know, their, their minds are open now, you know, and, you know, I, for years, I, I worked night shift at, at this level one trauma hospital. And I always remember seeing like the old, the commercials that would come on the paid advertisements at night of like, uh, water that would supposedly heal you, you know, and yeah, people one were paying morning, money and yeah. it was like, Hey, just three easy payments of $19 and 99 cents. I'm like, what? Like, you know, it might not have been that expensive. I forget what the price was. The fact that they were even selling it and claiming that it would like, uh, healing water. Or I forget what they called it, but like you, you made these payments and they would send you this water. It was probably very similar to this and, tap you know, water, and, yeah. and yeah, tap water. And, you know, I, I hate, I hate the, I hesitate to laugh. It's, it's funny. And it's really sad at the same time. It's almost like if we weren't laughing, we'd be crying. Cause you're right. absolutely right. Because so there are people they are taken advantage of. Cause you know, there's an elderly lady at home watching that maybe can't sleep well, worried about her family or whatever. And she's sitting there going, wow, this, this water, maybe it'll heal my, my knee, my knees, uh, bum knee. And I, I can't, I'm walking this, with this walker. And, you know, if I just pay these three easy payments of $20, 60 bucks later, man, I'm, I'm, I have a healed knee, you know? And it's just like, man, they're really, you know, that's those, you know, oftentimes too, I think that, uh, 
you know, it's a, a Titus 310 and like a Romans 16, 17 situation where it's like you mark them and you avoid them and you do so out of love. At the same time, you you do so because you you want that person who's teaching that mess to repent and, and right. come to, to know Jesus, come to teach the truth. At the, so your you concern is for that person. But at the same time, your main concern, I think, is the body your main concern would be people, to yeah. the vulnerable people the people who are being taken advantage of who really do need the help who really truly do uh, you know are are being led away by this stuff you know so it's not necessarily you know the kenneth copelands or the marcus rogers or the joyce myers or that necessarily them per se but it's the the people that are buying their books the people that are like oh man joel osteen just wrote another book i better go out and buy it so that i can get my life right you know it's like Right. Man, you know, Repent. that's, that's, yeah. that'd be, that'd be, yeah, you know, right. So, um, gosh, but anything else to add to that? I don't, I don't think so. I, I just think that this, you know, they're so out there. Well, I, I will say one thing, you know, you talk about Kenneth Copeland, I'll, I'll share this too. Not only in addition to that video when he was pointing and all that, but I think COVID really just exposed him big time. That's um, another one that blowing it away, COVID -19. blowing it away. And he was you like, know, you know, COVID-19, I know, curse you. How do people then, keep following him after that? Uh, yeah, well, see, and that goes, see, the reason he did all that is because it goes back to his name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, right? Because Kenneth Colbin was the guy who spoke that, you know, we're gods with a small G. He was one of the, the ringleaders of that. So he he was acting like a god and basically cursing COVID-19. And this is when COVID-19 first hit America. This is around, you know, April 2020, somewhere around there. Well, here it is now, 2022, and, you know, almost a million people got COVID as, as, as supposedly Kenneth Copeland cursed it. And, you know, and all these people died of COVID. One of them being my mom, she died of COVID back in September last year. So, you know, sorry to I, hear that. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you. And he, one of his best friends, Fred Price senior, he died of COVID. So, and he was also a health and wealth guy. So it just goes to show you what they were preaching for the last like 40 years or so was just total trash. But they're not going to, you know, repent of it or they're not going to renege of it because look at all the money that they made off of this. Look at all the, the houses and the status and the private jets and all the stuff that they got. I mean, um, Kenneth Copeland is well known for saying, you know, he's almost a million, a billionaire. Um, and when you look, if you Google his net worth, it's like like 760 million. So he's almost there. Um, so he's almost a billionaire right now. And he, so he's gotten all of that off of this false teaching of health and wealth, name it and claim it, blab it, grab it and all that. And COVID just completely exposed him. I mean, completely exposed him. And I, I did a video about that too, um, exposing him for the, the false, because he said, I stand right now in the office of a prophet and I curse COVID-19. Well, you're a false prophet then, brother. I mean, we already knew that, but now we really know. Um, so COVID-19 to me was like the nail in the coffin that just for once and for all prove how fake this guy is. Um, but you, to your point, man, people are still going to give him money. People are still going to follow this guy. And one of, one of the reasons, and then I'll shut up, is because a lot of these pastors and people, they want to be the next Kenneth Copeland, or they want to be on that platform. They want to be on that stage. They want to be somebody famous. That's why, like when T.D. Jakes was first started those mega fests, you know, and he rented out the Atlanta Coliseum where the Atlanta Falcons used to play. That's how Juanita Bynum got her start. That's how Jamal Bryant got his start is they, they preached that mega fest. And when they preached that mega fest then they blew up. Right. So a lot of these pastors, even if they don't agree with the Kenneth Copelands of the world, they're never going to come up against them. Why? Because that's where their bread is buttered. And they deep down, they have a, they have a need to be that next guy. So they're never going to come up against them because they want to be him or they want to have what he has. So, they're just going to keep shutting their mouth and they're not going to say anything because they want to be the next, which lacks integrity, which means they're cowards, all of that, all that stuff, because deep down, they want to be that next Kenneth Copeland. They want to be that next dude. They want to blow up like Juanita Bynum and Jamal Bryant did. So they're never going to do what I did and say, I repent. I used to teach that. I don't teach that anymore. I, I'm never going to teach that again. That was false teaching and everything I said was false. They're not going to do that. Because it comes up against their status, it comes up against their three point five four four million dollar house. It comes up against their ability to get a private jet. It comes up against their ability to get, you know, the Mercedes is and have that lavish lifestyle. So they're not going to, you know, walk away from that lavish lifestyle. So they continue to shut their mouth, so that gravy train of money can still keep coming in. So it's just. It's a money bracket scheme. It's about fame. It's about status. It's about notoriety. It's about, you know, 
how big is your church? How many people come to your conference? 20, 30,000. How many people are you running? That's what it's about. It's not even about Christ anymore. It's about numbers and fame and notoriety. And it's like, I'm not going to come up against it. Even though he may be wrong, I'm not going to speak against it because deep down you want to be that. And it's just, it's yeah. just scary. And I, I think that's a really good segue into, and again, gosh, that goes back to clout, like you said, power, money, and yep. that sort of thing, pride, arrogance, and all that sort of thing. I want to be that person that's at the top or whatever. Uh, and I think it's, you know, in many ways, <clears throat> excuse me. I do think it's all interconnected, all related, right? In other words, a lot of these false teachings and a lot of these false teachers, what they will do is it, it is more of a me centered quote unquote gospel. It's, it's, it's me, it's me, myself and I, yeah, yeah. It's the, the worship of the self, right? It's I'm at the center. Um, Self is at the center, not Christ, right? Because, you know, it's about what I can do, my political power, my clout my money my fame my name not his name you know not not you know galatians 2 20 i've been crucified with christ it's no longer i who live but christ who lives in me uh in this life i now live i live uh and by faith in the son of god who loved me and, and gave himself for me that's what the apostle paul says you know and if anybody had the ability like we mentioned earlier peter you mentioned uh david right if anybody had the ability to brag about themselves the apostle paul he had every right he was a pharisee a pharisee but now he, he's following jesus he he knew the law he knew the bible he was a jewish man so he was a uh jewish follower of jesus and you know he he could brag and boast if he wanted to um but he didn't you know he only bragged and boasted about christ you know and and he wanted to preach nothing but christ and him crucified right his his him risen and and that sort of a thing and so you know it's all related in that a lot of these false teachers and a lot of these false teachings are centered around yourself centered around the person rather than the person of christ right and i think it's a good segue into and i mean that's that's a similar thing that i think they all share and i want to try to segue this in and i think it goes back to did you want to mention like the nar i guess it's all interconnected like the the new apostolic reformation Reformation. i think is and that's how they you know i am apostle so and so and i'm apostle this and you know, did you want to mention anything else about that before? Yeah, well, just real quick. Um, they're, they're both, like you said, they're they're twins, but they have the same parents. They're interconnected. They have the same spiritual DNA running through them. And basically, they have the seven mountains of, of influence. Or, uh, Lance Wallnell calls it the, the seven mountains mandate. And, uh, you know, off the top of my head, it's like Christians have to control these seven mountains. And if they do, then basically they can, you know, usher in the 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 second coming of Christ by controlling the world, basically. So they're like, if we can control the media, if we can control entertainment, if we can control politics, if we can control the church, if we can control education, if we can control religion or whatever, there's seven, anyway, seven mountains. And they're like, if we can control these seven mountains, then we, we as Christians, we as the body of Christ would like rule and reign and have authority over the world. And then that's how God wants us to be. And it's a mis, it's a misinterpretation of the, the Lord's prayer when God says, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So they believe that, you know, and I just did a video about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, they believe basically we can make heaven on earth right now, not when Jesus comes back, but like right now. So for them, it's all about, well, there's no cancer in heaven. So therefore we should have no cancer on earth. You know, there's no AIDS in heaven. So we should have no AIDS on earth. Well, Believe it or not, Michael Brown, who's a Pentecostal, um, rebuked Bill Johnson, which I thought was ironic because, you know, usually you would see like maybe reformed Christian rebuke Bill Johnson for this. But no, it was actually Michael Brown. Yeah, I I think I just saw your video about this. Yeah, and I I posted um, uh, Fighting for the Faith, which is Pastor uh, Chris uh, Roseboro, um, who basically posted Michael Brown's video. And Michael Brown was like, no, like Bill Johnson, he gets that wrong because he's like, that's the case. Well, there's no sex in heaven. So that means his own married couple is going to procreate. You know, there's there's no lost souls in heaven. So I guess we have no need for evangelism now here on the earth, you know, and there's no death in heaven. So that mean nobody's going to die in the earth. You know, these are all stupid, stupid things. So you can't use that as a 100 percent universal statement that. Everything that happens on earth is going to, in heaven is going to happen on the earth. I mean, that's just a false, false teaching, particularly when the Bible teaches, you know, that we, we still live in a fallen earth. You know, we still live in a fallen world. 
And, and that, that, by the way, is also the context when you said all things work together for the good, Romans 8, 828. But right before that, he says, all of the creation is moaning and groaning, waiting for the sons of God to manifest and see prosperity preachers, word of faith, see like, that's, see, that's what we got to do. We're the sons of God. So we got to manifest and rise up and take our rightful place. That's that ownership again. That's that world domination. But if you read that, it says, even us, the sons of God, we're moaning and groaning, waiting for that too. So all of creation, including us, we're waiting for the second coming of Christ. So Christ can come and fix all this. So we're, that's why we have all this pain and suffering. And we still go through that pain and suffering too. So we're still moaning and groaning too. That's why it goes on to say, you know, that's why the spirit gives us moanings and groanings that cannot be uttered. Why? Because we're going through the mess too. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but they, again, they don't preach that. They just preach, see, we need to rise up and we need to be the sons of God because all of creation is waiting for us to rule and reign, Will. We need to rule and wane. That, that's what that scripture means. So again, the prosperity gospel, NAR, New Apostolic Reformation, it's all about bringing in the seven mountains and we controlling the seven mountains, either through the kingdom of God or through money. That's really the only difference is the means by which they get there. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's all about world power, control, and domination. And it's basically controlling the world through Christ. And I'm like, well, if that's the case, then why does Jesus have to usher in a new heaven and a new earth? I mean, why get a new earth if we're just going to rule the one we already have? So now, granted, we are going to rule and reign and have ju judgment and all that. And but that's that's future, right? But that's not what they teach. We need like they need to be doing that now. Now, again, here's the truth of it, though. You know, we are supposed to be doing something as Christians while we're still here, you know. We do evangelize. We do try to help. We do try to, you know, make the world a better place in our area of influence. You know, we're, we can't change the world by ourselves, but we try to do good. It's, the Bible says we're called to good work. So we are supposed to do something. We're not just supposed to sit on our butts and, you know, escape and can't wait till we die and, you know, I'll fly away. No, until we fly away, we're supposed to do something to occupy till he comes, right? So there is some truth to the bloom where you're planted, you know, have a purpose as far as what God wants you to do while you're here in the area of influence that you have, all of that, you know, that's why we evangelize. That's why we try to, you know, get people saved and, you know, so they can, you know, change their hearts and have a relationship with the Lord and all that. And hopefully as they do that, they start doing good works and you get rid of sin and you get rid of all this stuff. So there is an aspect of it. You know, you don't just go to church, pay your tithes and go home. No, we're supposed to be doing something. So I, to that part is true, but they take it to an extreme to where we're supposed to be ruling and reigning and running everything. Well, if that's the case, how are we any different from a deboing tyrant politician? You know, how are we any different from a mob boss? <laughs> you know, it, we're, we're not really any different. We're just being a mob boss for Christ. And this is where it gets really, really twisted really, really fast. And then when the, different with, the difference that I've seen in the NAR is now they start doing the spiritual gifts with it. So now it's all about tongues and speaking in tongues and having the manifestation of the power of God to where now it's like you're worshiping the power of God than worshiping God himself. So now it's like, well, the more you can like do tongues and have the miraculous, then again, the more mature, the more mature you may be, or the more powerful or the more anointed you are. So now you're pimping the gifts as a means to try to see Look what God can do when the gifts are flowing. Now we can really be in charge or whatever, because look at how God is moving in the spirit and all this other stuff. So now you're using spiritual gifts as a means to back up your false doctrine. And so, so now you got the tongues, interpretation of tongues and all this mystical, weird stuff that may be going on to try to back up and support the seven mountain mandate. Now it just gets really twisted. Yeah, amen, brother. And I like the way you worded it because you worded it, I believe, in the video, worshiping the gifts instead of the giver, I think is yeah. how you put that. But yeah, that, that was worded so well. I was like, man, that's so true because, you know, yeah, I, I do believe God does perform miracles and that's great. Praise the Lord, you know, that Absolutely. he does that. I do believe God works, God moves and, and that's wonderful, you know, but, with, you know, the temptation is to go, 
wow, look at this miracle instead of like, man, let's worship the Holy God. You know, it's, it's, you know, I would imagine that seeing Jesus risen, risen from the dead would have been amazing, you know, and that would have been an amazing miracle to see. I would have been like the uh, person that the, uh, there was a girl, a girl, I believe that shut the door on, I think not Jesus, but I think it was either, I think it was either Peter or the apostle Paul. I'm, I forget which one it was, but he, he made it out of prison. I think it was Paul. It was, it Maybe. was Peter. It was Rhoda. Peter. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she was like so excited and she like went there and like, Hey, everybody, you know, and she like, didn't even bother, like let him in, open the door and that sort of thing. I feel like I would, I would have been that person like, Oh man, this is so amazing. You know, but um, you know, and then there's the story in John 20, the doubting Thomas, he, he wouldn't believe unless he saw and he sees Jesus and, but he worships Jesus, right? He says, my Lord and my God. Um, He doesn't just say, Hey, this, that's an amazing miracle. This is so amazing. So anyway, I'm going to go about my life now, you know, like, I guess I did see the miracle. He did, he did prove me wrong, but I'm just going to keep it moving. You know, he's like right. my Lord, my God. And so, um, yeah, that's a really good segue into, I think uh, we'll touch a little bit on, uh, I guess, another false teaching that I think I, and <clears throat> excuse me, plenty of others have, have tried to call out. And that's this uh, CRT, whatever you want to call it, critical race theory, yep. critical social justice, uh, modern day social justice. Uh, I, it's really just a, a radical left, I think, uh, ideology. Uh, it's a, a different way, of, a different paradigm, right? A different way of viewing the world. I, I, I liken it to a totally different worldview. Um, I think Jason Whitaker from Dear World Christian does the same. He, he calls it a cult. You know, I think he's absolutely right. And I think there's a lot of similarities there because, you know, we mentioned how it's the gospel of me. It's the gospel of the person as opposed to be, which is a false gospel. It's, it's self-centered and, and centered on the uh, me, myself, and I, as opposed to centered on who Christ is and making much of him. And so there's so many similarities between all these different false teachings that have crept into the church and that people are embracing. You know, we mentioned Romans uh, chapter 12, verses one and two, second Corinthians 10, five Colossians two, eight, the Bible, there's a biblical imperative, right? The Bible tells us to call out these teachings and call out those who, who teach them. And we are not the ones being divisive when we are calling it out. You know, it's the right. ones who we are being truthful as best we can. None of us do this perfectly, obviously, but you know, you mentioned how, you know, the health, wealth and prosperity that the NAR and that sort of thing, they try to bring the kingdom on earth. They try to make it this world. And I think in a similar fashion, a lot of people who are propping them and they may not say, you know, you'll, you'll have people who will deny it. Right. And not too often will you say, Hey, this person's preaching and teaching CRT. Will they go? Yes, I am. I'm preaching and teaching CRT. No, they're going to go. No, I'm not. I, I don't preach CRT. I, I dislike CRT. I don't, I rebuke CRT, you know, or, you know, somebody will say, well, they're, they're preaching critical social justice, which is more of a, a Marxist, a cultural Marxist right. way of viewing social the world. Marxist, and they'll go, right. oh, you're just name calling. That's just ad hominem. You're just, you're just calling me a Marxist. That's not really what I am and what I'm doing. I'm not really teaching that stuff. And then they'll go on and they'll, they'll say things that are exactly that, you know? Um, and so one of the similarities I think is that you, how you mentioned the kingdom of God in this world, I think in their minds, they're, they're trying to reach a level of utopia, right? Like there's almost this politically left utopia where if we just hire these certain leaders and we just look this diverse and we just implement the doing the works of this sort of justice and that sort of justice. And we, we look, check off these boxes for DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. If we just do that, then we can reach this certain level of utopia, like heaven on earth and everybody will sing uh, songs and hold hands, sing Kumbaya and that sort of thing. And it's just like, well, well, no. Um, So basically if I had, if I had to put it all in a nutshell, I would say that it's, it is a, a culturally Marxist way of viewing the world. In other words, it's just, it's viewing people through the lens of you have whatever group you want to categorize them in um, and putting them in a box, uh, not looking at people as individuals, just seeing somebody like somebody would look at us and go, well, men, they're, they're men. So they're in the category of male. Um, you, you would look at our skin color and say, well, those white guys, so they're, they're white. Uh, and based on that category, based on those categories, and there's this intersectionality chart where you have different 
uh, sometimes they intersect. Like instead of being a, a male, somebody could be a woman and they would be a white woman, you know? And so she, you know, and it's oppressor versus oppressed categories where uh, depending on where you are on that chart, whether it's amount of melanin, you know, skin shade uh, or uh, male, female, or if you are in yeah, able-bodied or non-able-bodied and all these different categories, that is the amount of victimhood status that you can now claim. And so you now have a virtue signaling um, <clears throat> clout. You now have this ability to say, I am, uh, I, from where I stand, my, this is what people would call standpoint epistemology. It's, it's a whole lot of stuff mixed into it, but um, essentially it's, it's a bizarre way of viewing the world. And I, I think it's, it ends up being the very thing that it claims to be against. I, th I think it ends up yeah. being racist. I think it division. ends up being sexist. I think it ends up being, you know, ableist or whatever, you know? Um, and so uh, I think we've seen a lot of that in the church over the last handful of years. Uh, and I can give plenty of examples, but basically if you are categorized as a white um, heterosexual, uh, they group in sexuality with it. If oh, yeah. you are a white, uh, considered white and heterosexual and male, you are like considered the top victimizer, Worst, you are the right. oppressor just by dint of birth and who you are, how God made you. Um, but if you are, let's say you're black uh, and you are a woman and you're in a wheelchair and you're a lesbian, well, now you're a victim because you're in a wheelchair, you're a victim because you're black, you're a victim because you're a woman and you're a victim because, um, what was the other thing I said? Yeah, you're lesbian. So it's like, you know, and, and depending on where you fall in those charts, you are either the oppressor or you are the oppressed. And, and so that certainly is not, I would say, a, a biblical way of looking at it. I do think that there is some sprinkling of truth in there, obviously, mm -hmm. when it comes to like my heart goes out to anyone who has to be in a wheelchair. There are some things I do think they absolutely are right to have, you know, a spot or a bunch of spots at the front of the store that have wheelchair signs on them. They should have those. We should have ramps, I think. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. I'm not, you know... Um, you know, and, and I am mad at anybody because we've all seen the person that will pull up and park in that spot and then they'll get out. It'll be some young 20 year old who's using his grand, grandpa's car, or, you know, and you, you just shake your head at them like, yo, what are you doing? You know, so, I, you know, I think what happens is, you know, so obviously those people are in a sense, uh, quote unquote, victims, right? In a way you could say they could claim that, right? They're, they're having a rough life because of that. Um, I think there's certainly some truth. There definitely was slavery that was that was evil, that was sinful, obviously, you know, and I don't think anybody refutes that. Like, I don't think anybody looks back in American history and goes, you know what, we are perfect, man, we had the best history. We were just like, man, we were squeaky clean. Like, no, we were, not you know, I think most people will acknowledge that. Yeah, slavery, obviously a sin, a, a moral blot on America, right? Um, Jim Crow laws, uh, you know, segregation and redlining and all these different things throughout history, evil, sinful, bad. All right, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't even argue against the the historical argument Would somebody would say, you know, because of the history, the the this has happened and this has happened and so on and so forth. Um, right. But the well, problem that, becomes, point, can I, can I say that? That's yeah. Why yeah I, no, jump in. When on one of your posts, that's, that's why I asked you, I said, can we go deeper with that? Cause that's, that's actually one of the things I, I do think CRT gets right is the history of racism and how it has led to kind of, as you, if you walk the dog down the street, if you will, how we got to some of these things that where we are now, like where we are now didn't happen in the vacuum. And so I do think CRT, one thing that I can appreciate with it is they do walk the dog historically, if you will, to kind of show how we got here. Um, and this is when I asked you, I said, well, can we go deeper? Because what I have found, though, is now there's a rift in the body of Christ, though, is when if you do pay homage to CRT at all and say, historically, they do get some things right. That it's like, oh, now you're a Marxist socialist CRT supporter and basically you know just to, to to some cases like they, they might even question my salvation for even saying that and i'm like whoa i mean question my salvation to, to your point like you don't know me you know what i mean like you you don't know me and, and i profess to christ and you know i believe he rose on the third day and i'm washing the blood of the lamb so i'm saved 
Um, but that's kind of the rift that we have now is if you even say, hey, like that was wrong. Well, because I even heard one person, I, I got in one of these blogs, these Christian blogs. And, um, and it was something that John MacArthur said. And I was like, well, what about this, 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 and this? And in these blogs, when they're like giving praise to John MacArthur, you come up against John MacArthur, you're going to get it. I mean, you're going to, so I already knew I was going in the lion's den, but I was just like, what about this, 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 and this? And they were like, no, that's woke horse dumb. And I'm like, so like racism and this happened and this, like even in the church and this happened. And I gave all these examples and they're like, no, that's even more woke horse dumb. And by the way, you know, you're drinking the woke Kool-Aid and, you know, you're a leftist Democrat voting socialist Marxist. I mean, just nasty stuff they were saying about me. And I'm like, you do realize I'm none of those things, right? Like none of those things. Um, so there is kind of a divide now to where, to, the, to your point, if you even like say anything like that, like bring out the history and say, yeah, this happened, like slavery happened and Jim Crow happened and redlining happened. And because of all these things, like it has led to some things that we have today, like this happened, this is true. Oh, you're, you're, you're woke, Will. And, you know, you're so woke that you're drinking the woke Kool-Aid and, you know, how dare you? And I'm just like, hang on now, like, hang on. So I agree with you. CRT is dangerous. CRT is, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. But, but I do appreciate some of the history that they bring out. Um, but even in saying yeah. that, I get thrown to the wolves just by even saying that. Yeah. And I think uh, this goes back to, you know, opposite extremes, right? So even with like the more, gosh, because a lot of the NAR or a lot of the health, wealth and prosperity stuff is more in the charismatic or super hyper charismatic Pentecostal Correct. type of churches, right? So on the one hand, I think there's a lot of emotionalism. There's a lot of emotions, Absolutely. right? Which God gave us emotions, emotions in certain contexts that are proper and right. Um, so we shouldn't downplay emotions and that sort of thing. And if something's true, it's true. Uh, on the other hand, there's sort of this more reformed, um, I hesitate to say like Calvinistic, like cold hearted, just facts, facts don't care about your feelings. We're just going to speak the truth regardless of nothing. You know what I mean? And it's like, well, hold up now. You know I mean? You, you got to be careful. There's a line to, to tiptoe um, of truth and love. It's not, they're, they're, it's not to pick one truth or love. Which one are you going to do? You know, it's like, that's, that's a false uh, way of saying it. So yeah, you know, I, I think we need to be careful. I, I think, you know, what CRT, the thing is, and I almost don't even like, um, I know, um, I think A.D. Robles from, from, 80 Robles' channel, I think he tries to do the same, whereas he doesn't like to say CRT. And I think that's a good idea. I think it's tr it's good to avoid even using CRT because a lot of people don't know what it is. It, it gets complicated. Yeah. A lot of people get and you have swept up in trying terms. to. Yeah, a lot you're, of people you're get You're always swept defining, up and, I mean, even the word woke. I mean, mm -hmm. 15 years ago as a white guy, if they called you woke. That was a good thing because that means you were a white guy, but you were educated on the issues and, you know, you did everything you could to be educated and you weren't walking in ignorance anymore and so like being woke was a good thing but now if you're woke that means you're for gay marriage you're for transgenderism you're for L everything lgbtq yeah. you're you're so all about the racial cause that you preach you know racial stuff more than christ and just like woke now has taken on this new meaning to where you're everything anti-bible and i'm like no i'm not that <laughs> you know i'm not that so these words are always being redefined. Yeah. And that's why, that's why like, um, yeah, that's why like, I'm, I'm like, man, let's, let's keep it to the Bible. You know, that's, exactly. that's why I do the best I can to, to keep it with scripture. And so say, wait, well, if it's true, it's true. Um, because there, we really can't get away. It's, it's the one thing that's really, truly set in stone. That's why it's so important for us to be in our Bibles, because that's why it is the standard. That's why right. it's the standard, like the standard of truth, <laughs> April Chapman, shout out to her. Uh, but you know, yeah. So yeah, the thing with the history that I would say is that the problem with pointing to history to talk about problems of today, I would say is that 
when it comes to, and here I go again using the term, but CRT, a lot of times what they do is they'll cherry pick history. So they'll pick and choose which right. historical events they want to focus on. They'll pick and choose why they want to focus on them because they're using them as a tool for activism. They're not using them as a tool to get to truth. They're using it as a tool for activism. And for, it's almost like picking and choosing uh, quote unquote proof text, like the, the, right super hyper charismatic or health, wealth, and prosperity gospel people will do. They'll quote a Bible verse and they won't even quote the full verse. Um, a lot of times people in the social justice, modern day social justice movement will do the same thing, right? So when it comes to history, they'll go back with history, but they'll stop at a certain point, right? They won't talk about Jewish slavery for 400 years to the Egyptians, right? Because Jewish people predominantly are doing pretty well today. You know, they won't talk about the Holocaust where millions of Jews were murdered. (laughs) You know, that's an event that happened pretty recently in, in, in terms of history. And so they won't talk about that because they're doing pretty well today, but Jewish people certainly could claim victimhood status based on history. Absolutely. And they would be absolutely right and true to do so. Um, Japanese people, they were Japanese internment camps during World War II. World War II but America, typically speaking, absolutely. Asians and, and Japanese people were, are not considered victims. They're As a general rule, um, a lot of times they're not even considered, uh, there's that term BIPOC, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and that sort of thing. A lot of times uh, Japanese people aren't included in that because they're today doing pretty well as a general rule in, in America. And so, you know, I, I would just say there's a lot of stuff. There is some things, like we said, that there's sprinkling of truth that I think right. people who are, are well-intended, especially certain pastors that I think may have started off well-intended, they, they hear the truth of the history, like, yes, these bad things did happen in history. That is the truth. Absolutely. At the same time, is it happening today? Um, can we assume that because an incident happened today, it automatically means um, racism, or it automatically means that sexism, you know, if because Jane, the woman didn't get the job, is it because she's a woman or right. is it because exactly. somebody else was more qualified or maybe she just didn't interview right. well, you know, um, you know, and I'm not the super big Jordan Peter Peterson apologist or an enthusiastic about him, but he has made the point that, you know, women in general are just not as argumentative as men tend to be, or they're not as, they tend to be more agreeable, you know, and so when interviews and certain jobs and stuff, especially when it gets to higher levels, uh, you know, men, they, there's, there needs to be a, a certain argumentative feature, I guess, so to speak, for lack of a better word, but we could get into a lot of different things, but I guess the main thing being that you're viewing people through a different lens. You're not, instead of viewing people through the lens of this person's an image bearer of God, um, who is either a family member of mine in Christ, or they're, they're not, and they need the gospel. You're viewing people as either victims or victimizers as either oppressed or oppressors, um, based on outward appearance, you know, and then right. you get to, you know, plenty of verses in the Bible that tell us not to judge by outward appearance, plenty of verses in the Bible that tell no us to judge with, yeah, right. don't show partiality and that sort of a thing. And so if I could just give a, a couple of examples. Um, so there are a few lots actually, but there's uh, popular pastors like David Platt, um, Matt Chandler, and, and that sort of a thing where Matt Chandler gave that whole MLK 50 speech and in it, he really kind of bad a lot of white people, to be honest, it seems like to me. Um, and he mentioned how in hiring a pastor, he would hire a, a lesser I'm qualified sure, yeah, yeah. black man over a, a more qualified white guy. And so he didn't word it explicitly that way. But, you know, that was the point of what he was seeing. And it was just like, well, why? Like, why do you feel like you have to be their savior? Why do you feel like they need your help, Matt Chandler? Like, why do you feel like they couldn't be better than a white pastor? Like, why can't you just look for the black guy who's a better pastor? You know what I mean? Like, why do you got to hire him? Because even though he's lower, you know, as, and then there's a, uh, there's people like David Platt who would say things like, you know, as a white pastor, I am part of the problem. And as a white yeah, pastor, I, would, yeah, I need I to would, grow. And it's just like, like no. you know, it's like, ah, gosh, that's, that doesn't make any sense. You know, like, what right. are you even talking about? Uh, more recently, we had a uh, Phil Vischer say that Vody Bauckham would not be a good candidate for the SBC president because he's not he doesn't think like a lot of African Americans think or something I, I think Phil Vischer was trying to say that 
Vody Bauckham doesn't speak for black America, but at the same time, you got to think like, well, Phil Vischer's claiming to be a Christian saying this. And it's like, well, I don't know any one individual who would speak for the whole entire group. I don't speak for all quote unquote white people. I mean, I don't think you think you speak for all white people. Like, is there a person that we can say, Hey, you know, that guy right there, he speaks for all white people. Like it's silly. Like nobody does the, the, and that is the, the focus is on the externals. Again, the focus with this false teaching is on the me it's on the me, myself, and I, what gender are you? That's focus on your gender, uh, on your genitalia. Um, what's your skin color? Um, that's a focus on me. Well, I have this skin color. Therefore, I am in this group. Therefore, you can believe this about me. You know, it's like, well, that's just, just not true, you know? And, um, you know, and so, so much focus is on the person, um, but not the person of Jesus Christ, you know, not the Bible. Right. And, that's- um, and so I think, and that's the problem. And again, you know, some truth is sprinkled in, in that, yeah, their women didn't have the right to vote for all of American history. That's true. That's a fact. I'm not going to argue with that. That's true. Um, there have been men who have taken advantage in, in powerful positions of women. Bill Clinton, uh, Monica Lewinsky, you know, <laughs> that's a fact. Like, I'm not going to argue against that. You know what I'm saying? So there are some, you know, and I think people who are more emotional tend to be led away by more um, health, wealth, and prosperity stuff. And they also tend to be more led away by um, the CRT or, or woke social justice, whatever you want to label it type stuff as well. At the same time, I'm, I'm with you when you say, you know, hey, there's there's s- s- at least somewhat of a middle ground where we got to say, hey, you know, we can't just be cold and, and, and mean about it and say, well, the fact is, you know, what are you, a Marxist? And you can't just like, Right. be mean you about it. you have to be like that, right? well hold up you know I, this is why i'm labeling it cultural marxist because you're you're viewing people this way at the same time you do have a point over here with the history at the same time you do right. make a great point that these things have happened and we can talk about them we can address those things um, but we need to figure out what's true today what's right. going on today in our culture and why those things are going on because if we don't properly assess what the problem is, if we don't diagnose the problem properly, then we're not going to get any proper solution. And ultimately, right. for us as Christians, the diagnosis is sin. Um, and that's why I get so offended a lot of times when people harp on, well, you don't just preach the gospel. Well, kind of you do, you know, I mean, it's, it's central to who we are as Christians, because ultimately, the main problem is sin. It's my sin. It's your sin. It's all of us have sinned. Romans 3.23, right? The wages of sin is death, uh, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ. That's Romans 6.23, right? So Romans 8.1, there's no condemnation for those in Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and and you will be saved, Acts 16.31. And there's no salvation anywhere or in no other name except Jesus, Acts 4.12. So you know, John 3, 16 applies to, to all who believe, right? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. And that should be our main and focused message um, that's central. Like even when I did prison ministry, um, I've done children's ministry for years and years now, um, far longer than I did prison ministry. And, you know, I've helped feed the homeless and all at the center of all of that is Christ. All at the center is the gospel. Hey, repent and believe, you know, put your trust in Christ, you know, he mm-hmm. only in him can you be forgiven. Um, and so that's the main message, you know, and, and and then that gospel then goes and changes people's lives. You know, you mentioned, we're not just saved from sin, we're saved to good works and to good works as well, right? Because you mentioned how we're not just saved to sit on our butts and go, well, thank God I'm saved. I'm going to sit here and glory be to God. I can't wait to be in paradise with him. You know, thief on the cross, Luke 23, I'm going to be in paradise soon. You know, (laughs) you coming yet? You know, Um, so Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, I believe is uh, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. Uh, it is a free gift of God, right? It's not your own merit. It's not of works so that no one can boast. But then verse 10, it goes on to say, for we are his workmanship yep. created in Christ Jesus for good works or to do good works, right? So we should be working. We should, uh, you know, even in, in context, um, Philippians 2.12, I think says, work out your salvation with fear and twir- trembling. That doesn't mean we work our way to God. We earn right. our salvation. You no, it, it, works, you know, you should be doing it, works because you're saved. Yeah. 
Absolutely. It's, it's people are getting the uh, cart before the horse, right? They're trying to say, well, you work. And it's like, no, 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 no. You are saved. And because you are saved, it's God who's working in you right. to do those good works. And then you now need to go and submit yourself to God and, and do those good works, you know? And so um, I think the temptation is there in that there is some truth to all of it. Um, but we have to be very, very, very careful because it's mixed with a whole lot of lies and it's mixed with a whole lot of assumptions. Um, you know, the assumption being that, well, this police officer is racist. Well, how do you know that? Because he's white, you know, and how, well, how do you know he's being racist? Because the suspect was a black guy. Well, how do you know there's racism there? Because there is, because they're systemically racist, you know? And it's like, Mm. I, what like that right. just let's and, and get the re- to the truth like you know and i so. hate that in the church and to kind of go further because i talked about some of the stuff about crt that i can appreciate but let me tell you what i don't and and this is where it has no business being in the church because i was talking to a lady a white lady who's also a member of, you know she's saved and she's like i'm i'm a, I'm a member of a oppressive of regime and uh, you know because that's what crt or whatever taught her and i'm like no you're a member of the body of Christ. Like, you're not supposed to be that. Like, see, and this, and this, I, I just dropped a video on this today, earlier today, because as a member of the body of Christ, we are totally countercultural to what the world is saying. So if they say we're supposed to be going left and we say, no, we go right. If they say go right, we're supposed to be going left. Like our message and how we live our life is completely countercultural to our culture, to our society, to what they're saying. So if they say we're oppressive, then we say, no, I've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb and I'm not oppressive. I'm supposed to be known by my love and I'm supposed to be known about how we're supposed to love, not my skin color or how I treat people, but I treat people because I'm redeemed. So my whole identity is in Christ now, not these, like I said, these filters, these lenses by which we look through. The lens I look through now is through the blood of Christ, not what the world, the label in which the, the world puts me in. So I don't claim to that. So when, when David Platt said, I'm part of the problem, says who? Christ does it. Now, granted, that doesn't mean you might not have blind spots. Okay. You might've had severe blind spots for years. Okay. So use the George Floyd situation. And I don't say situation, but use that tragedy to get rid of your blind spots and then do better. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It just means you might have a blind spot. So use, use that, use that and be better now. Right. And Um, the other thing too, with that is don't project that on other people, right? Because projection is often one of those things. It's like, listen, I, I may struggle with tons of sins and I do Um, I'm saved by God's grace, but one sin that I know that I know that I don't struggle with is racism. I could not care less what somebody's skin color is, you know? And so like when somebody like a David Platt, who's supposed to know better projects that onto me, like, well, you also have a problem and you know, I know you have a problem because you're white too, just like I am, you know? And it's like, well, that's (laughs) so you know, you, you can't, you, like you said, you can't project, but, but two, it's, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not always true. You know, even when black lives matter happened and there was a whole bunch of those marches, there was a whole lot of white people in those marches. And so to your point, they weren't racist and they were trying to help the best way that they knew how based upon what they thought. So they weren't trying to be racist. They were actually in support of black people. So how can you say all white people are oppressive? Look, they're trying to help you right now. So you cannot project that on, just like you said earlier, one person can't speak for all the people that skin color. Same thing here. Just because you may have a problem with it doesn't mean everybody else does. So you can't put that on everybody. So in the body of Christ, you know, when I, when I, when I did my interview with April Chapman, I said, look, the body of Christ, the blood of Jesus, Jesus is the great unifier of all humanity. The blood of Jesus is the great unifier of all humanity. So if you, if you are a Christian, you know, you got my, my black, my black brothers and sisters here. I got my Asian black brothers and sisters here. I got my Hispanic brothers and sisters here. I got my white brothers and sisters here. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We are all now we're not blind. We can see that there's physical differences, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. We are equal at the cross. CRT won't teach you that. CRT teaches you that you're different. And because you're different now as a white person, you're an oppressor because the system benefited you. Well, even then, that's not true because there's a whole bunch of white people that are getting left at the curb, too. (laughs) You know, there's a lot of poor white people out there that are getting getting the short end of the stick every day, too. So the whole, you know, the whole system benefiting all white people, that's not a universal statement because there's some white people getting hosed over every day too. You know, look at all the poor people in Flint, Michigan. They got, they got, you know, water poisoning just like everybody else. So, I mean, people get screwed every day, you know? So you can't use these teachings as a 100% universalism for everybody. 
because it just doesn't work. But especially in the body of Christ, because again, we're countercultural. Um, I like the way one of my minister friends said it just today. I was reading this today. He said, you know, we should not accept the label of the world to define us when the world did not design us, right? So why are we accepting these labels to define us when we're supposed to be defined by Christ? Because he's the one who designed us. And in the body of Christ, we're not supposed to be having all that. We're not supposed to be having this oppressed, you know, versus, you know, the oppressor. No, we are all one in Christ Jesus. And the reason we can be that way, because the Bible says we're all of sin. So all of us were jacked up to start with. So Christ redeems us. So if we had any kind of oppression, racism, and inclination, all that. Jesus died for all that at the cross. And now I'm supposed to be dead to that. I'm supposed to be repenting that. I'm supposed to be getting rid of that. So now we have a clean slate in Christ. But CRT teaches, even if you got the clean slate, it's still not good enough. Even if, you know, even if you were redeemed, you still got some work you got to do because you're a white person. No, I don't have white guilt because I've been redeemed by the love of the land. <laughs> okay. I don't have white guilt. White guilt doesn't associate with me as a member of the body of Christ. And even if I did do anything wrong, once I got saved, it was nailed to the cross, man. Now, can I do better? And again, call to good works? Yeah, we do that every day. But you're not going to project this guilt on me just because I'm white. No, I identify with Christ. I'm a member of the body of Christ. And I have, I belong to a different worldly, I don't even have, I don't have that worldview. I belong to the kingdom of Christ. And that's, that's what I go with. Amen, brother. You know, it's like with my silly example earlier about the adulterous pastor, right? He may be a male, he's a man, but that does not mean that we now project that on all males. You know, it doesn't mean like, hey, you know, if you are a man and you have a certain genitalia, then if you are in this congregation, you need to corporately repent. And it's like, what? Like corporately repent for what? Adultery. Right. Because you're all adulterous. Like, I, no, I'm not. <laughs> you know, yes, you are. How do you know I'm adulterous? Because you're a man, you know? And it's like, that's the same thing that they're doing with skin color. It's like, just because you have white skin doesn't make you a racist. Right. Just because you have white skin doesn't mean you're pro-slavery or pro-whiteness or exactly. all this stuff. And, you know, and you made a really solid point that, you know, we, as a general rule, we should look different than the world, right? I believe it's Correct. Matthew 5. Jesus talks about the city on the hill cannot be hidden. Um, you know, around verse 14 or so, you should let your light shine and, you know, lamp isn't hidden whatever I'm, I'm butchering. No, I, got <laughs> but, you. Um, I got you. But yeah. So, you know, we should look different. The world should look at us and go, there's something different about them. They they're loving, they're speaking the truth as best they can. They're, they're doing all these things and yet they're not being mean and, and nasty and all this stuff. They're accepting that, which is true and whatever, whatever. Um, you know, and it's like, when the world says these things, we cannot just assume, well, the world means the same thing we mean. It's like, no, they don't. They're, no, they they're, they're looking at things through a non-Christian lens, you know, uh, through a totally different lens that's not Christian. And, you know, in Christ, that there's so, you know, it's so funny because people think they're not religious, but they get more religious when they relieve, leave the scriptures. When they leave the Bible, they set up, you know, there's all these different check boxes of doing the work. You mentioned, you know, some, even a lot of white people were marching with BLM. Well, that's like one of the things you do. Well, did you post the black square? Because you must post right. the black square on your social media. Are you marching with BLM? Because you must march for BLM. And it is a constant and forever doing the work, quote unquote, you are never, you are always condemned, right? I mentioned right. Romans 8, 1, where there's now no condemnation, no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. By the way, that applies to men, that applies to women, that applies to black, brown, whatever, you know, White I mentioned people, prison everybody. ministry. Yep. Yeah, I, I didn't go to prison and do prison ministry because I'm a good guy. I went because I love Jesus, because he first loved me, and because he changed me. You know, I'm a new creation in Christ, and we all are, Second Corinthians uh, 5, 17, if you're in Christ, you are a new creation. And it's not by your works, it's by the works of God in you. And so as God's working in you, you then go and live a different lifestyle. And so the people I ministered there were black, brown, all sorts of different ethnicities in that white, you know, whatever. Um, it didn't matter, you know, because we yeah. were either in Christ or we weren't. The guys who weren't, you know, I, I did the best I could to share the gospel with them. It didn't matter what their skin color was. It doesn't, you know, and neither does genitalia. Now, again, the truth would be that it doesn't make you not black if you're black. It doesn't make you not European if you're European. And, you know, it doesn't make you not a man. If you're a man, you're a man. If you're a woman, you're a woman. And there, there's truth sprinkled in and that 
there has been some oppression in the past for sure. And there, I'm sure there's oppression that still goes on today. I, you know, I'm sure there are a police officer or police officers out there who maybe yeah. do have some racist mentalities. I'm sure you can find them. Um, yeah. The problem is we have to look at the truth and say, well, we have to be truth seekers as Christians, right? And when we have to be, you made a great point again, you got to be countercultural because the culture as a general rule is going to be pro- pushing and promoting stuff that is not in line with reality. That's not in line with truth because we have a, a Romans one situation where the world is like pushing a volleyball down in the water, in the pool, right? Like they are suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And that's where they're coming from. They're not coming from the same book that we can the right. sure word from god that we can go to as christians and say no this is set in stone this is the word of because it's the word of god and because it's true and that's our starting point is god and his word um now we all have our lenses we all have different biases and we all have different things that we have to deny in ourselves um but that's our starting point and that ought to make us look very different than the world and in this critical social justice or leftist ideology or whatever people want to label it, you know, it doesn't view the world the same way. It views certain groups of people based on outward appearance or, or mm-hmm. sex or whatever as oppressed and, and they're forever and always in that category. Um, and then there's other people who are guilty. You mentioned white guilt. Um, Shelby Steele is a writer. He wrote a book called white guilt where he, and he's a black guy and he was talking about it. He's like, yeah, a lot of people just have white guilt. They're just guilty because of the truth of the history. And it's like, well, Jesus says that you are forgiven. <clears throat> Correct. And it especially bothers us or bothers me. At least I know it bothers a lot of people as Christians because we should be some of the most forgiving people in the world because we know that we've been forgiven much. And so we should forgive much. Um, And so gosh, to see Christians talk the way that a lot of these Christians are talking, you know, and I've experienced this in, in a church and I know many other people have experienced this in church and have their own personal experiences with it as well. This is a worldview and it, 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 has implications of how you interact with people and and how you think about people. And I think the way that we ought to interact with people and think about people should be based on the Bible, not based on what Robin D'Angelo is saying and and how you're guilty via association by dent of skin color or your gender or you're complicit. You're complicit because you're a man. Like I, my silly example with the adulterous pastor, you're complicit with that adultery because you're a man, you know, it's like, that's the logic that's used and that's not biblical, (laughs) you know, it's like, well, I guess no other men can be pastors in that church because they're all guilty of adultery because that one pastor did, you know, and it's just like, that's, you know, and it goes down to so many different um, categories because it it doesn't just stop at skin color. You know, a, a lot of people have likened it to train carts or cars. I don't know if it's carts or cars, whatever, but, but it's like, you know, one yeah. cars, it's like one car after another, right? Like this car is skin color and this car is sexuality. Are you with men and you're a man? Are you a woman and you're with women? And, and this other car right here is transgenderism and you're a man that claims to be a woman. And so now, you know, and then this other car right here is, um, I don't know. It's just, it's never ending, you know? And it's just like, we have a final sure word of God, the Bible. And that from there we can go, okay, well, it doesn't matter. You know, you're, you're a male. Okay. You're a woman. Great. Where you're either in Christ, you're not. That's my main, my main thought, but uh, we've talked a lot. I'll let you have the last uh, few words here and appreciate this again, brother. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Um, Thank you so much for having me and just, you know, being on your channel. And I, I just thank you so much for um, giving me the time to talk about a lot of these issues that are, you know, facing, I can't even say facing the body of Christ. They've been in, the, unfortunately, been peppered throughout the body of Christ for decades now. Um, CRT is like the, the new big one. But before that, you know, it was prosperity, gospel, word of faith, and a little bit of the hyper grace movement too, where, you know, God just wants you just, you know, there is no sin, you know, well, there is sin, but we don't preach on it. We don't talk about holiness. It's just grace, grace, grace. To your point, I heard a guy say one time, you know, if you give everybody, you know, because Jesus came in grace and truth, you know, but if you give everybody all grace and no truth, you're a coward. But if you give them, you know, um, you know, uh, all truth and no grace, then you're a tyrant. So you want to make sure that you give both. And unfortunately, you know, to your, you kept saying this all throughout our conversation today, there's extremes. And, you know, the hyper grace movement is like, well, where's the truth? 
And in the legalistic movement, you got a whole bunch of truth, but where's the grace? And so you need, you need both. And that's what Jesus did. So there's extremes. Like you said, there, there's, tr there's some truth sprinkled into some of these things. And then they get suckered into that truth, but they don't see all the low hanging fruit of the falsality that's still right in front of their face too. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of falsality and, you know, hyper grace to word of faith to prosperity gospel. And now the new, new one, CRT. Yeah, there's some truth in there, but there's some low hanging falsality. that's going to get you wrapped around the axle if you bite off and do it. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. And I just posted a video today about CRT and how it's affected my family personally. Um, so yeah, feel free to check that out. But yeah, there's this, it's, you know, we, we have to make sure we, we get our identity through the word and not what the world is telling us. Amen, brother. Well said. Well, Mr. Brother Joe Bahoda, everybody definitely go check out his channel. I'll put a, this, a link to his channel in the description of this video below. I believe we are probably both going to upload this. My internet's slow, so it'll probably take forever. But yeah, me too. <laughs> um, yeah, this has been fun, brother. This has been a lot of fun. And, and you said it really well, the last bit there. You know, we go to the Bible. That's, that's where we go to. That's our standard. And uh, I'm going to share this scripture real quick this is john chapter 16 verse 33 it says uh i have told you this is jesus talking he says i have told you these things so that in me you may have peace in this world you will have trouble but take heart i have overcome the world so jesus is talking to the disciples tell them how crazy this world is and how crazy to, we should expect it to be um that's to be expected but in christ in jesus you will have peace so i would encourage anybody who doesn't know the Lord, doesn't know Christ to really, truly question yourself. Um, I believe it's second Corinthians 13, five or seven, where it talks about test yourselves, uh, to see if you're even in the faith, right? So we are called to examine ourselves, uh, make sure we know Jesus. And if we know Jesus, we know peace. And as people who follow Jesus, we follow the truth. Um, and so we, we need to make sure that the things we're believing are true things. And more importantly, that they're based in, in scripture, uh, that we can support the ideologies we're following, support the, the things that we're supporting uh, based on the word of God and not based on what someone just tells us. So question what I'm saying as well. Don't just listen to me. Yeah, be a Berean. Bible for yourself. Be Absolutely. a Berean. Amen. Absolutely. And so I think that's what we're both encouraging people to do. So thanks again, brother Joe, really appreciate that. My hat tip to you, not only as a Christian brother in Christ, but uh, as a, as a military man and as a chaplain and as all that good stuff, man. So we're, brothers in arms and we're also brothers in the lord and dads and husbands and so uh, another but love and respect for you brother thanks again you too will thank you so much right. thanks bro all right